Well, welcome everyone to today's latest talk in the Herman Miller Insight series. We are looking at getting a variety of speakers and covering a variety of subjects. And I'm really looking forward to today's event. It's very much about you looking at the history of, of, of offices using London as the lens that we're going to be looking through. And I'm really pleased to welcome Rob Harris, who's joining us. Rob is a consultant, an analyst, and a writer in the commercial real estate sector. And he's spent over three decades, I think he likes putting decades because it sounds better than 30 years, <laughs> advising <laughs> occupiers, developers, investors, and public sector bodies. And his interest and experience range from advising occupiers on the way they use the space to urban policies that help shape for future cities. And he says it sums him up by looking at the workstation to the city region. Rob is a, an, an author as well, and he has a new book coming out this year. And I've got some news. I am gonna pre-order 10 of those books, and 10 of you lucky people are gonna be winning a copy of that when it's published in April, Rob, I believe. Isn't that right? April the 8th. Okay, so when we get that, I'm, we're going to do a lucky draw. Ten of you are going to get a copy of this fantastic new book from Rob. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Just for those that have just joined us, if you could turn your videos off, but do use the chat box to let us know where you're calling from. But more importantly, we're going to be putting questions to Rob at the end. Rob, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. We're looking forward to this. Thank you very much indeed, Mark. Uh, there we go. Well, good, good, hello everybody, and thank you for joining this session. Uh, it's great to see so many of you from around the world. What I'd like to do is to invite you to take a step back this morning from your day jobs uh, and to take a longer view of the past. Uh, and in these, in these COVID times in particular, I'd like to invite you to take a break, if you like, from the stresses and strains of thinking about the future. We've, which we've all been doing in the past 12 months, the future of the office, for example, um, which has moved from a debate about the demise, the finish, the end of the office, uh, through to a more balanced consensus now about the uh, something called the hybrid office. Uh, but actually, who knows where we're going in the future? But hopefully, by looking back into the past, we can also draw some lessons for the future. That's my hope for this book, at least. And so I'd like you to sort of sit back for half an hour or so and just take this deep dive into the past. Now, the book I've written that Mark alludes to is organized around a series of thematic chapters uh, from pure history to explanations of city growth, to planning, to building, to mediating, involving architecture, surveying, engineering, and so on, to working, managing, that's corporate real estate management, and thinking about the future. Um, and as Mark said, my laboratory for all this is London. Um, apologies for those of you that don't know London, but I think um, you'll, you'll agree that it is a great laboratory for studying the, the history of the office. Now, for this morning, rather than do this thematic examination of the office, I've chosen a, 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 a chronological story. Um, now, don't worry so much about the detail on this stake diagram, as I call it, because I'll be reproducing the relevant parts of it through the presentation. But essentially, it sums up what I call the five ages of the office. Over here on the left, we've got the counting houses and coffee houses period from 1650 to 1800. In here, we have the growth of the clerical factories, that I'm sure you're aware of, with the, the production style office environments. Then we move post-war into the corporate office era, with the growth of, growth of large corporations. And then in around the middle of the 80s, we moved into what I call the digital office era over here. And we've come, I think now, possibly towards the end of that in 2020. And my bit of divining on the future down here is on 2020 onwards, which I call the network office. So the book is built around these five eras of the office, coffee houses, clerical factories, corporate offices, digital offices, and network offices. 
Before we go into the history, though, I have to take you through some prehistory. I think we have to do this for the sake of completeness. Now, the people of ancient Egypt um, recorded transactions, inventories, accounts, and prepared documents. They used scribes uh, who were employed to record everything from proceedings to legal matters to medical procedures and so on. Then, really, we take a quite a leap of time through to the 14th century uh, Renaissance Europe, uh, and particularly in, in Italy. So hello to our friends down in Italy there today. You were the forerunners of the office environment, you'd be pleased to know. Um, in Bologna, for example, there was the Loggia di Macianti, and I apologise for my pronunciation, from 1382. And in Barcelona, the Tuella de Canvi. By the 15th century, um, merchants and bankers were practising what was recognisably modern office techniques today. In 1494, Lucia Pacioli publishes Summa Dei, uh, which effectively codified double entry bookkeeping and uh, known as the Venice system. Uh, the cover is illustrated on the left here. This basically laid the foundations of modern accountancy. So when you uh, blame accountants for running the world today, this is effectively where they uh, learnt their trade in the ancient past. Now, some of the oldest banks are still around from this period. Uh, Giovanni Medici founded the Medici Bank in 1397, complete with a counting room or office to oversee the affairs of the bank. And he also sought to introduce um, some elements of a basic um, financial system based on bills of exchange. The oldest bank still in existence, the Bank of Monte de Pace in Siena, operating continuously since 1472. And famously, a lot of historic books about the office uh, refer to the Uffizi Gallery in Florence which was commissioned by Cosimo de Medici um, to house the Florentine magistrates of the time. So by the end of the 16th century, we had the rudiments of a crude banking system in place. But Italy's role began to wane at this time and Northern Europe began to grow significantly and rapidly. And in the 16th century, um, Antwerp, particularly grew as a, as a, as a, as a major centre for, for, for trade. Here we see the Alma de Blos in Antwerp with its um, beautiful building, as you can see here, voluminous in scale with its rectangular space and the covered galleries around the first floor. Beautiful building, really the focal point for European trade at the time. And this was then mimicked elsewhere in Northern Europe. And in, in London, we had our, our first stock exchange opened in 1565 followed by other exchanges in uh, Rotterdam, Amsterdam, Hamburg, Delft, and so forth later on. So a quick counter there through some of the prehistory of the office, because most of these buildings were markets and exchanges. They weren't, they weren't offices in the sense that we know the term today. So the first part of our, our stake diagram that you saw earlier was, was this coffee houses and counting houses period that you see on the scale here. This began with the coffee house movement um, down here. And we, we, along the scale up here, we show some of the major developments and people that we meet throughout the book. The coffee houses were the original co-working spaces of London, and they were brought to London by the exotically named Pasqua Rosé in, 19, in 1652. He was a Greek um, who developed a taste for coffee while working in Turkey um, and really introduced the coffee shop to, 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 uh, to, to London. Selling coffee from 1652, building up to a, a business selling over 600 dishes a day. So these weren't the, the buckets you get from Starbucks. These were shallow dishes um, selling coffee uh, as a delicacy almost um, at the time. And by 1663, there are 80, 82 outlets, um, uh, uh, really very significant growth. During this time, you see um, a couple of examples here of, of technology with Alexander Bell demonstrating the first telephone uh, and, and the most. Uh, Telegraph there. Now, this handsome gentleman on the right, Nicholas Barbon, uh, was really one of the, he was a physician. Uh, a lot of people were, were polymaths in these days. He was a physician, a financier, an economist. He was also one of London's first speculative developers. And he was the chap who gave developers and the developing industry their bad name as rapacious, unscrupulous, and riding roadshot over, over the law. And in fact, in 1684, he took on the lawyers of, of Gray's Inn Road uh, in London uh, and literally in a pitched battle with, with pitchforks and shovels and bricks, fought a battle with the lawyers over a piece of land on which he then built his, his largest development 
which is now known as Red Lion Square. History records that several injuries were sustained on both sides, um, but Barbon prevailed and went on and built his development. By the way, just as an aside, in terms of the coffee shops, at the same time as having five or six hundred coffee shops, London had 207 inns, 447 taverns, and nearly 6,000 alehouses, which means it had one licensed premise for every 13.4 private dwellings. So I'll move on quickly from that point. The first office building um, in London, recognised the office building, was East India House, uh, which is built on the site of what is now the Lloyds of London building in Leadenhall Street. It was originally built uh, in 1640 uh, and reconstructed in 1729. And this is one of the later reconstructions of the building that you can see on this slide. No expense was spared in this building, lavish furnishing, ornate carvings and velvet furnishings. Um, but behind the palatial rich facade, there was a grim reality of the clerk's life. And one of the most famous uh, employees of this building was Charles Lamb, um, who was famous for his works, essay, Essays of Ilia and Tales of Shakespeare. And he was a, a socialite, um, a literary, he mixed with Coleridge and Wordsworth and other, other such of, of, of the time. Um, but his, his life as a clerk had a darker side because after a fierce series of setbacks, um, culminating in his sister uh, stabbing their mother to death and him being rejected by his first love in life, um, he was forced to take a lowly position as, as a clerk in this massive company of the time, where he stayed for 33 years. And I find this quote from him very poignant towards the end of his time there. I grow ominously tired. 30 years I have served the Philistines. You don't know how wearisome it is to breathe the air of four pent walls without relief. Day after day, all the golden hours of the day between 10 and 4, without ease or interposition. Oh, for a few years between the grave and the desk. Now, I know that some of you who work in offices commuting to big cities every day will feel exactly the same way uh, a few hundred years later, I'm sure. Also this time we had who, what, what is now my, my favourite developer uh, with, a, with a much uh, kinder character than Barbon. And this was, of course, uh, Thomas Cubitt, um, who built large parts of London. He was a son of a Norfolk carpenter and he learned his, his, uh, his, his trade as a ship's carpenter before setting up Grazing Road in 1810. Now, the significance of Cubitt for this story is that he was the first builder to directly employ craftsmen. Up until this point, they were all effectively what we call today subcontractors. But Cubitt set up a firm and employed them permanently on, on full-time wages, and then became really the, London's first general contractor or developer. And he changed the skyline of London effectively, um, almost single-handedly. Um, he built the squares in Belgrave, Eaton, Chester, Lowndes squares, for which he brought earth, dug out of the docks in East London um, to, to level the land. And he built for the royalty as well. He built um, uh, Queen Victoria's house, uh, Osborne House on the Isle of Wight. And he had a very close relationship with um, uh, Queen Victoria. And on his death, she wrote in her diary, a better, kinder hearted or more simple, unassuming man never breathed. Uh, a great gentleman, and a great developer of his time. Buildings at this time, up to this time, were built for purpose, for occupiers, for, for, for wealthy individuals, for businesses. But we have also at this time the start of what we call speculative building, when buildings are put up for the open market uh, for, for a particular purpose. This began to change in the 1830s. And there's a quote here from uh, uh, Edward Lounson, who was an architect, uh, who was giving a paper to the Royal Institution of Surveyors in 1864. Where he mentioned the first building which I remember to have been erected for that special purpose was a stack of office buildings in Clements Lane at the end nearest Lombard Street. This dated from 1823 by the architect Voisey. So we have here evidence of our first speculative office building in London and possibly the world in 1823. So coming towards the end of this period, uh, this counting houses period, London was the financial capital of Europe and the centre of world trade. Uh, and it was shaped physically and economically by a generation of international financiers, including Rothschild, Hambro, Kleinworks, Schroeder and Seligman. The first joint stock companies were set up in, in London um, at this time. 
which were the forerunners of our modern corporations. So that really is a counter through the first age of our office, coffee houses and counting houses. We now move on to what I call the, uh, the clerical factories, 1859-30. Uh, the boundaries, by the way, for these, off these eras are open to debate. There's nothing clinical about the edges of them, um, but they give a broad indication of how things changed at the time. Here we see roughly 1850 to 1927, 1930 maybe, um, and we see banks building on big, big lavish scales. We see inventions in the office such as the telephone, sorry, I beg your pardon, the, 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 the typewriter, even the, the humble paperclip during this time, believe it or not, um, the telephone. London got its first motor bus, um, and we also had our first lifts and incandescent lamps, all steps on the way to building larger and bigger and grander buildings. By the way, the, the, the image on the right here um, was, is of Edwin Siebels, who introduced lateral filing in 1898. Now, this might seem a little um, uh, peculiar and a bit, bit, bit not, uh, niche, but it had a huge effect, actually, because his creation revolutionised record keeping. Up until this point, businesses had folded papers in envelopes and placed them in pigeonholes and file drawers. His genius was to recognise that finding and opening envelopes was wasteful and that folding paper wasn't actually necessary. If papers could be kept in large envelopes standing vertically one next to the other, as you see in the filing cabinets there. Now, the sad end to this story is that um, Edward Siebels acted on an idea and presented his specification to Globe Wernicke in Cincinnati and he had them make five example cases which then Siebel's tried to patent. Um, but the sad point about this is that um, the patent people turned him down on the basis that his, his, his sample formed an idea and not a product. And so the poor chap did make a bean out of his invention uh, because it was deemed to be an idea and not a new product. Through this time, buildings became much more lavish. Here we have the National Provisional Bank on, on Bishopsgate in 1867 far more grandiose, far more complex than, than their predecessors. And this is by Gibson. It was a single story building. Um, the brief was to be bolder and grander than the Bank of England itself. And you can see the, the carvings on the top and the, the ornate uh, Corinthian columns, all to convey the wealth and stature of the institution. Here we have the Royal Bank of Scotland or, on Bishopsgate in 1877. Again, elegant with lower, lower floors with iconic columns arches and spandrels, a lot of carved detail. And on the left here, we have Prudential um, buildings on, on High Holborn in 1879, an iconic building in its own right. And indeed, it's worth remembering that Prudential at this time, just in the UK, were managing 9 million life policies in 1891. Can you imagine the amount of paper uh, that that entailed um, and the, 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 the industrial scale of of paper management that must have taken place. General Credit and Finance uh, in Lothbury, which is another classic beautiful building this time. Uh, absolutely fantastic, as you can see there, um, General Credit and Finance Company. But not everybody was in favour of this new grandeur. grandeur. Um, and the banking sector's own magazine suggested in 1863 that banks were succumbing to a love of show, leading eventually to excessive expenditure and sometimes embarrassment. Um, so, yes, not everybody thought the same way. We also, at this time, saw, as we said on our, our scale earlier, saw the introduction of lifts or elevators, as our cousins call them. Um, now, they, was, they were operating, lifts were operating in London hotels from the 1850s, uh, but the first office lifts came in about 1873. Uh, hydraulic lifts in Palmerston buildings behind Old Broad Street, uh, which were installed at a cost of £750. Um, so, a great... Uh, period of invention at this time. It was also a period of, of grander thinking about urban planning. Um, and this is an example here, which I call the Edwardian Broadgate. Um, you'll see here the old pattern, or this is the Thames down here, through Somerset House rising towards High Holborn. Uh, the old street pattern in white underneath and the new Kingsway that was built at this time is 30 metre wide boulevard uh, coming down from uh, uh, Victor Frederick Place uh, to, to what is now the Old Witch. Um, massive scale planning at the time, opened by Edward VII to much pomp in 1905, um, and three and a half thousand residents lost their homes 
in the uh, in the configuration of this of this creation uh, this road scheme. But the, the relevance here is that it also led to a number of well a large number of, of new modern offices buildings for the time. Now I've just illustrated two here for illustrative purposes. On the left we've got GEC's Magnet House. Uh, a lot of buildings were built for occupiers at this time, and this is one of them by Frank Atkinson, constructed for General Electric. Um, now the building survived the war um, intact. Um, unfortunately, it didn't survive Harry Himes afterwards, who bought it uh, and raised it. And yes, he put a Richard Seifert building in its place. So we were, we was robbed at that point, I'm afraid. But on the right here, we have um, a building that's had a number of uh, lives. It's one of two identical buildings at the bottom of Kingsway. Uh, this is this is two Kingsway, which is built in 1913 to 1914. Um, it began life as the HQ for the Air Ministry after the First World War, and was renamed a Dastral House by them. Then it became uh, the headquarters of Rediffusion. Uh, it was renamed Television House. Then it became St Catherine's House with the government, and now it's the Centrium. And down here on the ground floor, Mark will recognise is the Herman Miller showroom. So a little plug for Herman Miller halfway through here. At the end of that period, so we now move from that era to what I call the corporate offices. So this is the basically the post-war period, uh, uh, post-Second World War that is, when we moved into what you might call the more modern era of the office. Um, we had air conditioning come into offices and fluorescent lamps you see down here, big uh, statement buildings like Langham Place, Senate House, Shelmex House, the Welcome Building, County of London Building. We had building booms, speculative building booms for the first time in terms of commercial space. Um, we, we had things like um, mainframe computers appear. Um, and we also had planning, urban planning take a big influence, which I'll come back to in a moment. But it's interesting, isn't it, that during this period of only, what, 50 years, we, we moved from fluorescent lamps to crude copiers, to the Gulf War typewriter, to the IBM PC, which is a fascinating kind of summary of, of the period, really, in many respects. Such rapidly changing technology. It was also the period when we started experimenting uh, with, with office layouts. So we moved from the production line layouts of the previous period to the action office, which was famously promoted by, 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 by Mark's colleagues at Herman Miller. The Combi office, and we also had um, the Bureau Landshaft experiment. Um, none of these really solved the problem, if I can put it that way. There were problems with each, there were positives with each. But at the end of the day, the office remained the office, and there were still some issues with it. But I've got two quotes which really sum up the issues here. The first is by Robert Prost from Herman Miller, who said, Today's office is a wasteland, it saps vitality, blocks talent frustrates accomplishment, it's a scene of daily unfulfilled intentions and failed efforts. It plays a fantasy conjecture rather than accomplishment. It fosters physical and mental decline, and depresses capacity to perform. <laughs> if ever you can find a, a more comprehensive attack on the office at the time, I, I challenge you to find it for me. And Studs Terkel, who was an American sociologist, reflected on the office suggesting work should be about a search for daily meaning as well as daily bread. For recognition as well as cash, for astonishment rather than torpor, in short, a sort of life rather than a Monday through Friday sort of dying. And again, that quote resonates with a lot of things I read on LinkedIn every day today about the current debate about what is the future of the office and do we want to go to what it was. Indeed, some of the offices from this time reflect that. Um, we had some quirky ones, such as the Daily Express building here, which had the first curtain wall building in the world in 1932 in Fleet Street. And over here we have the NatWest Tower, a Richard Seifert building, delivered in 1980. And until that time was the, uh, the so after that time was the, the highest building in London. But the, 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 the majority of buildings were like this one on London Wall, large, gray, cheap office slabs that served no real aesthetic purpose whatsoever. I mentioned earlier the period of planning. Um, the post-war period we saw the uh, the emergence of, of planning, big time, um, once license controls were abolished after the war, which were introduced to ration building materials, obviously. Um, London completions rose from less than a million square feet to nearly six million square feet per annum. 
And it was at this time we saw the emergence of the anti-office movement. In London, we've turned our backs on offices. And in fact, we tried to force them away from the centre. There was this misconstrued notion that offices were part of a problem, uh, which was leading con to congestion in central London. And the government asked local government, London County Council, to address the problem, which they tried to do in some respects. But the government, the central government, lost patience in the end and took its own direct action. And in 1964, it introduced something called the Location of Office Bureau, which in George Orwell terms should have been called the Relocation of Offices Bureau, because its sole purpose was to encourage office occupiers to leave London and go elsewhere. And in 1964 also, we had the Secretary of State for Economic Affairs, George Brown, introduce his white paper, Offices. And this led to the, the Brown ban, which meant that from henceforth, office development permits were required for the construction of any building, wait for it, larger than two and a half thousand square feet. Yeah, square feet, that's 200 square meters in rough terms. And furthermore, that any such building would have to have a named user. So effectively, they were putting the brakes on offices in London at this time. Uh, th and this is the 1960s, remember. Uh, there was no attempt whatsoever to understand in spatial planning terms what the office economy was, how it's changing, how it's evolving, and then how it come to become the most dominant aspect of the national and indeed international economy years later. It was, in my sense, a crash dereliction of duty, and it led in 1984 to two colossal errors, which I explain on the left here. The first was that uh, a gentleman called George Nicholson, who was the chair of the Greater London Council's planning committee, said, and I quote here, there are no forecasts indicating there is a real demand for office space much in excess of current take-up rates. Indeed, many firms are cutting back their corporate staffing and are occupying smaller suites, not the quarter or half million square foot monsters beloved by developers. So there you have it, the, the London's strategic planning authority in 1984 saying, we don't need any more large buildings. And in the city of London, the financial heart of, the, of, of London, the city corporation published its draft local plan, key illustration shown here, in which it covered 70% of the core area with conservation area status, meaning that no new buildings could be built there. This is 1984. And in 1984 also, Rosehill Greco, a very advanced developer, completed one of Finsbury Avenue, one of my all-time favourite buildings of the modern era, um, delivered in 94. But it was, it was inspired by what the developer knew was happening in the banking sector. It was tailored to upcoming requirements. So on the one hand, we had the planning authorities that didn't have a clue what was going on, where the development industry was shaping up for the changes that were about to happen. So in summary, at the end of this period, up to 1985, prior to Big Bang, our economy was still largely manufacturing based. Many offices were still associated with industrial activity. Things like the fax, the fax machine and the golf ball typewriter were, were actually leading edge technologies. Uh, PCs were not widely available. There was no internet, no email, no mobile phones, no social media, no digital media technology. We had no Canary Wharf, no Channel Tunnel. Um, 25. Big Bang uh, was, a, was a cosmological theory. Um, and London's cuisine, um, to be polite in mixed company, was mediocre. Uh, and coffee culture was a, a quaint French custom. That was London in 1985, um, prior to Big Bang. But of course, we had Big Bang and we moved from what's illustrated here on the right, the London Stock Exchange floor, where we have brokers broking deals day in, day out, to fix dealing floors in individual buildings. The shakeup was profound uh, and led to a whole new era of what we call the digital office, our final uh, or penultimate period of, 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 this, of, this, of this presentation, running as I say from the mid 80s through to about the current time. And it's extraordinary, isn't it, how these time scales that I've been showing with this snake diagram have been getting shorter and shorter. And look what happened in the past 30 years uh, in terms of technology, uh, the impact of change. Um, I love this image here, this, this photographic image, because it shows 
old clerical factory buildings down here. Reflected in this building is the NatWest Tower. And it, here, the corporate, which is a corporate office, obviously. And in here, we have London's latest addition, which is 22 Bishopsgate. So you see, see three eras of building captured in that one picture, which I think is a lovely image uh, and brings us bang up to date uh, with where we are now. Obviously, there's some images on the right here about Microsoft and, and mobile telephones and so forth. Um, but we also, at this time, we began to understand buildings in a different kind of way. Understand them, deliver them, design them. This is some work we did early on in, in, in DGW back in the early days, looking at depth in buildings, because these were buildings on a scale altogether larger than what had been delivered before in London in terms of depth and scale. Um, and we began to understand how organizations were using buildings in a different kind of way, both spatially, space planning, but also technologically uh, speaking. We had ground, ground scrapers for the first time. This is uh, the back of uh, Bishopsgate in Broadgate, um, uh, a, a monumental building um, um, for, for its time. And this whole period uh, gave birth to uh, a whole new generation of buildings in London. Um, here we capture what we call the first generation mega schemes. Now each of these dots here, the red ones, was a scheme of 1 million square feet plus de de delivered in an integrated fashion. So we have Broadgate, which was the first one. Then we have Canary Wharf. We have London, more London on the, on the South Bank, Shard, London Bridge City, Regent's Place up on the up on the Euston Road and Paddington uh, and further out Chiswick Park. Now just those few schemes during this 1980s to 2020 period, they delivered 25 million square feet of space uh, and uh, many are not complete yet. We've now had a second generation of, of mega schemes come through at Euston. You, some of you will be familiar with the fantastic scheme that is now King's Cross out at the Olympics at Stratford and down on the South Bank at Waterloo, Battersea, where Apple have their new headquarters, um, Google are up at King's Cross. So a whole new architecture, a whole new real estate industry, creating a necklace of schemes around the core area of the centre of London, delivering an architecture in a workplace which we didn't have before. So to begin to sum up, the, the four areas eras that are presented, counting houses, factories, corporates and digital, are summarised on this chart here. As I said earlier, the, the approximate dates are approximate dates. Um, we can talk about that. But I also give here some of the themes, the work and place themes from each of those periods. The technologies that were coming through at the time and some of the brands that were there, um, many of which, you know, Mark Eddy, for example, Waterman, they're still with us to this current day. But I think the, the, the important point about this diagram is it, it leads us on to think about what happens next. And I think, as I said earlier, this is what I call the, the, uh, the, the network office. And it's a curious fact, I think, that this network office economy described here in terms of knowledge, commodities, exchange uh, and, and distribution is, has more in common with the first era, the coffee houses and the exchanges at that time, than it does with any of the intervening three periods. I think that says something about where we're going in the future. It builds some lessons for us uh, and it, it helps us think about how we consider the workplace in the context of the urban structure, but also in terms of, of working and living. Um, and I think that's hugely important. Now, who knows what this means in terms of the workplace itself? My book finishes with some speculation on that. Uh, now, this might look a bit odd to start with, um, lots of spider diagrams, but they're very simple, really. Um, but they present some options for the future, for the network economy. This is the traditional model uh, where everybody left their home each day empty and travelled into a central HQ. We all understand that model really well, the commuting model. Um, there's one that's been popularised more recently, uh, pre-COVID, I should say, which is where there's some working from home each day. Uh, but still relying upon an HQ. There's a home and spoke model where the HQ establishes some regional offices and encourages people to use those regional offices, but using a virtual connection into the HQ um, to, to do virtual meetings and communications. There's then a hub and service model. So instead of the, the occupier having their own offices in the regions, 
they rely on a serviced office model a format where uh, people go to their serviced office each day but sometimes go to HQ physically and sometimes go virtually then there's the dispersed model where there isn't an HQ at all um, but the company establishes a series of nodes around the country which works better in a, a large integrated economy like America than it does in a lot of um, European smaller economies and then there's what I call the entirely dispersed model where there's no HQ other than a simple building somewhere but it's not central and uh, everybody relies on their own working from anywhere model so be they co-workers be they uh, clients be they airports uh, but it's essentially a dispersed and agile anywhere model now the network office is likely to be a combination of those activities um, because there is no single solution for the issue I don't believe but at least they give some hint of, of where we might be moving in terms of delivering and managing office space in the future so that's me done um, I hope you all enjoyed that to some degree and got something from it in terms of the history Mark over to you Rob, thank you very much. That was outstanding. And I've got now behind me the Herman Miller showroom in, uh, in, the, uh, in my backdrop. <laughs> I thought that would be good, yeah. And, and I don't know if you also know that the building that we're in was once where the Beatle and the Who and the Rolling Stones once played. They because did. it used to be uh, recording a pop show there. I did once take my guitar in to say that I've played in the same venue <laughs> as the Who and the Beatles, which is probably cheating rob this has been outstanding especially as i started work in 1976 and uh, scarily have worked talk, use a lot of those machines that you were referring to and if anyone wants to read about that do check out my blog because i do i do reminisce quite a bit there but i've got a couple of questions for you rob uh one coming up here could you talk about over the years the change in role of architects that they have played in Ooh in the development uh, in cities and obviously we're talking about london that's a fascinating question that's a fascinating question I, I, the the chapter in my book uh called uh, mediating deals with that specific point um and it traces the the, the evolution of the architect from being uh, the client's preferred uh consultant if you like um people turn to their architects to build buildings for them uh, and the architect was the kingpin the person in charge, the, the person who, who, who controlled the whole process. Um, and obviously over the years with Spectre development, that's, that's changed somewhat. Uh, and the architectural role uh, has changed fundamentally uh, because, well, for a number of factors, really too, too much to discuss here, but just very broadly speaking, uh, in terms of the commercial office, um, we have the interior and the exterior. And the interior has become so sophisticated in terms of what it's trying to do, i.e. satisfy individual workers, that there's been a separation almost between the interior design of the environment and the exterior building design. And I'm not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing, um, but external architecture has, has, has taken on uh, a, a, a very important critical role in defining what a building is. But separate to that, the interior has taken on a different set of functions. And so architects no longer control the whole building design. That's one of the most important things for me. Um, but I think also they need to, there's an opportunity for architecture and design to reestablish um, some, some, if you like, control of the process, because we're in a period now where we need that more than we need real estate management, if I can put it that way. We need interior design, envir interior environments to be designed um, for people uh, and, and and for for purpose, and I think the, the role of the architect is, is is fundamental to that. So it's, it's changed from being uh, the, the 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 person that sits on the right arm of the clerk uh, of the client to becoming a commercial deliverer of space, and that's been a long journey, uh, which, which which I spell out more eloquently in more, in more detail in the book. Um, but I think going forward, there's a there's a bigger role for the architect and designer if I can conclude the two together. Okay, thanks, Rob. And I think probably related to this is, can you comment on how office space standards have changed in the past century and what scenarios there might be for space standards in the future? Uh, Post-COVID, I guess, is what that's referring to there oh, as well. Yeah, and I, I see we're talking about densities, are we? Yeah, 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 I guess that's the case. 
Yeah, uh, well, this, this is a kind of special subject of mine. <laughs> I've written papers for this for the British Council for Offices. Now, over the period 1980 to recently, we saw density drop from somewhere around 20 square metres a person in Europe um, to, to somewhere around 10. So a halving of densities. The same didn't happen in America because there was less pressure on real estate and land prices. But we saw a halving of, of, of uh, densities here, or put another way, a doubling of densities um, to the point pre-COVID, we, we were packing people in at up to eight square meters per person net letable. And on top of that, um, utilizing a desk at more than, more than one a person. So there's a double whammy of much higher density and much higher utilization. That has to change going forward. It was the wrong route to start with. It was the wrong measure. Uh, uh, and it's, it's inhuman. And it reminds me of Charles Lamb's comments about the office and studs total uh, and, and props. You know, we're, we, we're in the danger of creating factories again. And that has to change because we have to move from this purely cost driven model of design and architecture and client to one that's about value and social relevance. And that's the huge change that I see coming forward. I'm not a great believer in massive fundamental change in urban structures as a result of COVID. I am a great believer that office design and particularly densities and layouts will change radically as a result of COVID. Rob, thank you very much for challenging us all there. And I think this is an interesting one again related. Who's going to drive any change in the office offer? Is it the pension funds, the developers, <laughs> operators, or will it be the occupiers? And I know that's an area you get involved with a lot. Uh, it's Look, everybody's got to play their role in this. Um, the, the, it, it will not be led by one one constituency, um, least of all the the the, uh, the owning uh, institutional community. They will come along to the party when they know they've got to do so, and they will do so full heartedly at that point. But up, up to that point, they will not come to the party. So it has to be led by a combination of 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 uh, of, of, uh, of constituencies, and we have these tribes in our industry. We have a construction tribe, we have a design tribe, we have a management tribe, and none of these tribes talk to each other. So we design buildings without taking account of who's occupying them. We manage them as if they're pieces of real estate rather than corporate infrastructure. So these constituents have to come together and work more closely to say what the future should be. It won't come from one, one constituency. It, we need to start working together and breaking down some of these silos between the tribes. Great, thank you very much for that. And uh, I thought I'd just read you someone's observation because I think we do have memories of different days that someone said that my first office in 1985 was Marsham Towers. It had a cafe, a snack bar, a basement bar and a games area, large open offices with plenty full space, personal storage, kitchenettes, and the environment was collegiate and respectful. We also worked to relax nine to five day and rarely took work home. Have we lost something somewhere along the line? I thought that was an interesting view there. So I'd let that person to get in touch with me because I'd love to know a bit more about that. Okay, sorry. And I, I'll i check to see who that's from, but do do uh, get in touch and Rob's details are on the screen. So do 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 that. Okay, are we, we're seeing the resurgence of the company campus and do you see these working within a hub and spoke model? In short, no. Um, I, I don't, I haven't seen a resurgence of the office campus yet. I've seen a few examples of large tech companies looking after their interests um, to ensure that they're labor pool available. But I haven't seen um, a resurgence of, 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 of occupied campuses, certainly not in Europe. Um, or indeed Asia, um, and I don't, I don't think they have a great relevance. In Europe, we our cities are quite small compared to uh, elsewhere in the world. And I, mean, I lived near one, for example, um, a city called Norwich. And in the past, the biggest employer in this, in this city was Norwich Union, which is an insurance company. And it used to employ eight or nine or 10,000 people, which is a huge number. Uh, but it was the one horse town. You either worked for Norwich Union or you didn't. It was the job market. And the, the fundamental feature about today's economy is people's desire to move. 
between jobs, between contracts, between employers, uh, and so on and so forth. And if you're on a campus somewhere, you take that ability away from yourself. So I, I'm a firm believer in in CBD concentration, um, not in that in the, entirely in the previous mode, but uh, in terms of efficiency, I am. And I think um, the job market and the flexibility in employment terms is key. And I, I see campuses as an issue for that reason. Okay, thank you. Uh, and Gary writes, that does, do you suppose that the most important office from 2020 onwards is actually going to be the de dedicated home office facility? The most important from 2020? Uh, interesting. <laughs> it will have been the most important in 2020 um, and possibly a bit of 2021. Afterwards, I don't think so, no. It'll become part of a a, a tapestry of, 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 of work environments, I think, um, ranging from the, the, the home to the service office, to the co-working, to the dedicated office in the centre of the, the city uh, and other options as well. Um, it's become one of a number of, uh, become part of the distributed model, basically. Thank you. That's that's uh, that's excellent. In fact, I I am going to steal that. I do like that idea of it being a tapestry as well. I do I do like that. Okay. Um, what do you think are the standout lessons during the development of offices over the years? What, what you know, we want to go away with a couple of lessons. What should they be, Rob? Okay. Um, the the office. Um, has always had two customers, the people that use it and the people that own it. And the standout lesson for me is that we've built offices of people that own them. We haven't built people, offices of people that occupy them. We need to move from that model of institutions owning buildings and thereby owning the specification, the layout, the color, the pattern, etc., to a model where we're designing buildings for occupiers. And that's a fundamental lesson for me of that period of time. The customer is the occupier. And if, if, if the co-working uh, serviced managed space market is doing nothing else, it's teaching us that fundamental lesson. They're offering choice, they're offering flexibility. You can come and go as you please. Uh, and that's for me fundamental. That would be the single biggest lesson. If we could change that model and in the process, get away from the language of landlord and tenant to provider and occupier or provider, operator and customer, something like that. That would be a huge step forward. The occupier has been at the end of the process, not in the centre. It's what I call my pre-Copernican model. You know, um, the, 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 up to now, the, the investor has sat in the middle of the process in a pre-Copernican model. Uh, in the future, the occupier will sit in the middle uh, in a more enlightened period. Thank you. And in fact, that question that you asked earlier, who asked that you'd like to speak to them, was Neil Usher. So you, so, <laughs> so, I'm sure. so and he, he does make the point actually that we're moving from B to B to B to C, basically. And I think that also answers a question that Peter Bowman put was, if you were to plan a new office from scratch, where would you start? And I think you've summed that up as being user centric rather than developer. Yeah. Centric. Rob, this has been, I really enjoyed this. This is, uh, I'm going to go and watch the video back so that everyone knows. We will, f uh, Rob is very kindly sharing his slide deck with you. So that will be in a follow up email tomorrow. Rob, if you want to stop sharing so that people can see your face, and because I do like the tradition of waving goodbye as people disappear, do check out our other events as well. I have to tell you that the event in two weeks time is completely sold out the one with oliver baxter so uh great to have everyone feel free to put your cameras on now and and, and get and give rob a white rob excellent stuff we're going to share you a link as well how you can buy rob's book and there will be a draw tomorrow so thank you everyone for joining us rob thank, thank you, you for an excellent session thank enjoy you enjoy the rest of your day i'm going to leave it on for a little bit leave any notes of thanks for rob Enjoy your day. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, everybody.